Welcome to Hashing It Out, a podcast where we talk to the tech innovators behind blockchain infrastructure and decentralized networks. We dive into the weeds to get at why and how people build this technology and the problems they face along the way. Come listen and learn from the best in the business so you can join their ranks. All right, episode 27 of Hashing It Out. As always, I'm Dr. Corey Petty with my co-host, Colin Couchet. Say what's up, Colin. What's up, Colin? Today, we have a special guest, um, Dr. Glenn Weil from the very popularized books, Radical Markets. Um, We wanted to have him on to kind of dive deep into the implications of the types of markets he, he brings up in his book and how they may be used in decentralized systems and uh, implications therein. And just talk generally about how he's how he feels about this space, the markets that he proposes, and the, I guess potential of them, them actually being applied in today's society. So, welcome to the show, Doctor Glenwell. Hey, I'm glad to be here with you, Colin and Corey. Yeah, no, this is great. I'm, I'm glad you came on. Uh, I I, I uh, really loved your book. Um, read it for at first back in April. Um, just some amazing implications. We've mentioned on the show several times. Uh, a lot of the people in the space have read your book um, and are con- and it's continuing to be talked about even at, you know, at this point. So it, one thing that was funny is I read, uh, there was some article that was saying that sort of as part of the crypto hipster look, you were supposed to have a copy of the book. So, <laughs> well, count me in on that then. I guess I'm a crypto <laughs> hipster, but yeah, no, it's, it's a wonderful book. Uh, I really, really thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, so I guess, I guess to begin, I, I, I think it's interesting when I read the the title "Radical Markets," I was thinking, "Oh, radical like crazy!" But you actually had a different meaning for that title. The word "radical" didn't mean like you know, you know, revolutionary. Although it does have that implication. Um, what? What? Why did you name the book "Radical Markets"? Yeah, the title has about five different meanings at the same time. Uh, one meaning is what you just said, revolutionary or bold or something like that. A second one is um, getting to the root of issues. So radical etymologically means root. So the book is trying to get to the sort of fundamental things about the ways that markets operate. But probably the strongest meaning is that in the uh, 19th and uh, late 18th century, there was a movement called the philosophical radicals. Um, And in fact, there were parties all over the world called radical parties. And it was radical in roughly the sense of radical liberalism. Liberalism is, you know, liberal as in liberal democracy. And uh, this was a political movement that included people like Jeremy Bentham, John Stuart Mill, Adam Smith, um, Beatrice Webb, and others who were trying to really change fundamental things about social institutions in order to free them from the legacies of feudalism. And uh, that's probably the main meaning, but it also refers to the fact that we have this thing called quadratic voting, which uses a square function. So there's like square roots in there too. Um, There are uh, uh, several other meetings as well. So uh, it, it, it was a very carefully chosen word to reflect all those things at one time, but also to be sort of edgy and lefty a little bit at the same time that it was referring to markets, which are usually associated with sort of the libertarian right. Man, and I think what's interesting about all of that is that you capture it quite well in the book with the things that you bring forth. Um, can I don't know how to start this because we have so many questions. Why don't we maybe just give an idea of uh, like a surface level introduction to the markets you propose in the book. Uh, so should I just run through the ideas? Yeah, I think that's a great, I think it's yeah. a great way to just give the audience a, a general like over the like, overview of, of what we're talking about here. Yeah, I think so, you've, I've identified like four major ones. So there's a Vickery auction, Texas shootout, ses- yeah. self-assessed tax- taxation and quadratic voting. And all yeah. of those seem to have direct implications on what we're doing. So, I mean, yeah. I'd really like to 
break break down into those if that's all right. And the other thing I would say is that, you know, those are the ideas that are literally in the book, but then there's also a number of follow-up things that I've been working on with Vitalik uh, Buterin and others that um, might be of relevance, including ways to use these ideas to fund open source software development or more generally self-organizing communities. Um, ways to deal with uh, signaling and status positioning, um, ways to deal with distributed identity and auctions. So um, there's the book, and then there's a broader space of um, ideas that we're increasingly calling radical exchange um, around that. Yeah, so when when you say radical exchange, you mean to say something that doesn't require a lot of trust in order to make sure that the net, that the market is operating. Uh, see, this is just something that's kind of like throwing me off. Are we striving in in your book? Are we striving for the goal of equality or just provable fairness? What the fundamental principle of the book is not either equality or fairness, but the opposition to concentrated, historically derived, hierarchical authority, um, something that people in this space might call decentralization. Uh, I would call it liberalism um, in the sort Classical of, sense, yeah. Yeah. And Which is more like libertarianism in the U.S. Well, yeah. not quite, because it, modern uh, libertarianism is... Um, Modern libertarianism is not necessarily fully reflective of that tradition because it often assumes that we can take for granted a number of fundamental social institutions that actually impede those goals of preventing the diffusion of, you know, preventing the concentration of power. So a lot of libertarians assume that we can maintain a decentralized competitive uh, open society while allowing absolute private property. And we don't believe that. We think that idea was discredited in the late 19th century by the liberal philosophical radicals of that period. Um, and that therefore modern libertarianism is confused. But, yeah. um, but in terms of the principles we have, they're the ones that are the common basis of both modern libertarianism and modern progressivism. And we're trying to really reunite those types of ideas. See, that's really cool. So I've been reading a lot of Hayek and Friedman lately. lately. Just to see, I've noticed that eco economics and, and you know computer science are starting to have the blurred line in certain areas. So I really wanted to understand the other side of things. So I've been reading uh, Hayek and Friedman and uh, one of the interesting distinctions they made was abstracting away the word communism, so, uh, socialism, capitalism. And instead, focus on terms like central planning and decentralized systems. And the, you know, they've identified one of the advantages to central planning is its decisiveness. And we'll, it'll always work like in a pinch to solve an immediate issue. But the issue with decentralized systems is that they take time to evolve and correct and find an optimal path or process. So do you feel like with the events of these trustless systems, we could create like a new way, a provably decisive, like decentralized market? Well, I think that the truth is that it always will take, in order to maintain decentralization, a constant struggle to find ways to organize things that maintain that decentralization. And um, it will always be easy um, to resort to some sort of fully centralized decision-making, but it's not robust. It's something that's very fragile yeah. to the intentions and the vision of those entrusted with that authority. Because it's very difficult to change central planning, you know, once, once a policy is made. Yeah, it's um, not just difficult to change, but it's also, it responds to whoever does it. You know, so for example, Singapore runs very well, largely because it uses a lot of market-oriented mechanisms. But who was it that chose to put those in? It was pretty much a dictator, di dictatorial or semi-dictatorial system rather than some sort of democracy. Now, you might say, well, let's go imitate that. Let's set up a lot of charter cities or seasteading where we 
in a dictatorial way impose market mechanisms. And I think the problem with that is that that works maybe in Singapore, but for every Singapore, we have a hundred Zimbabwe's. And mm -hmm. um, I prefer to um, use the mechanisms that we want to see organized society to bring about that organization so that we don't, um, you know, hope that we'll, through some dictatorship of the proletariat institute, uh, some ideal world. We need to actually harness the centralization, harness radically democratic principles to build a radically democratic society. Yeah, and and you've this, the cool thing about this book is that it it really crosses into so many different aspects. I mean, you start off talking about property ownership, just the very fundamental concept of owning property, which you mentioned earlier as a tenant of um, you know core principle behind the modern libertarian movement is you know my property, my problem. Um, you know, uh, so uh, you know your first chapter kind of claims that property ownership is a type of monopoly. Um, and I thought this was some kind of tongue in cheek statement when I first read it, but you made a very careful and clear argument to support that statement. And, and it's actually kind of literal the way you wrote it. Um, so I was wondering if you could elucidate on our audience on why property is a monopoly. So, um, I think everyone intuitively identifies with the notion that intellectual property is the right to exclude people from using some idea, but we don't think of physical property that way as a monopoly over a piece of land. Um, but of course, that to the extent we don't think about that, it's because we assume that there's just as good land that other people could use or take. And in some circumstances, maybe that's true, but in many cases, that's not true. Think about the cities that we live in. Um, every block, every plot of land is sort of unique because it's situated in a neighborhood that plays a particular role in relationship to everything else. If you want to build this highway, if you want to build a shopping mall, if you want to build a skyscraper, it may not be that there are just equally good places to do that. This may really be the right place for it. And as such, you'll, whoever happens to own that thing has a monopoly over it. And there can be very little check on their ability to exercise that monopoly power. Um, and that's not just true for land. It's true for the radio spectrum, where if you own some little uh, over-the-air broadcaster, you can just um, use uh, your ownership of that to potentially block the whole ability of Verizon to establish a nationwide 5G network, right? Um, right. Yeah. And it's that arbitrary and unchecked power to control an asset which you didn't create in the first place and is really part of the earth, um, which is a government granted privilege. It's a government granted monopoly, just like the monopolies that uh, Adam Smith decried and that uh, Milton Friedman rails against. So one of the ways you propose that we kind of like look at this problem or, or, or kind of reevaluate how we organize the concept of ownership, because clearly people, people don't want to not have things, not have shelter, for instance, um, was the idea of a self-assessed taxation system. Yeah. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, my understanding of it is that someone assesses the value of their property kind of with the condition that they pay a certain amount of value of that valuation, um, like every month, kind of like a mortgage. Um, and if someone is willing to value it for more by a certain threshold, the owner must sell to this person. They have to sell to this person. Um, and like that kind of turns everything on their head because people don't want their houses to suddenly like slip out from under them, for instance. People don't want somebody to suddenly take their car. Um, and so I was wondering if you could maybe discuss a little more about the market you proposed for self-assessed uh, tax or, you know, described for self-assessed taxation and um, its implications and how maybe a central authority wouldn't be the best way to necessarily uh, organize that kind of system. Yeah, so... You uh, mentioned that people might not want someone to take their property, and that's true. They don't want them to take their property uh, for 
no price, right? Obviously. On the other hand, if someone offered you a billion dollars for your pencil, you'd probably be pretty happy about that, right? So really the thing is that every asset has some willingness that we would have to accept for that asset. And when you have a tax charged, then you don't want to set too high of a price because you have to pay taxes on it, but you don't want to set too low of a price because then they might take it for you for less than it's worth to you. And if you set this tax right, if you set it at a rate that's equal to the average turnover rate of an asset, the average rate at which it you know, gets sold on to a new use, you can exactly balance these things and give people an incentive to um, report exactly how much they'd be willing to accept for the asset so that whenever anyone buys it from them, they're not upset. They just say, well, okay, I was willing to accept that amount of money for it. If you put it in the hands of a central authority, on the other hand, they're going to have to come in from the outside without any knowledge of what that individual really values it at and determine what the individual should be willing to accept for the asset. And that is uh, not going to do a very good job of actually allocating things to the people who value them the most and protecting people against things being taken uh, where they are really the best owners of it. Yeah, I see like, uh, and, and the outcome or the proposed outcome of this is that um, property flows to the people who can utilize it most. Is that correct? Yeah, best in in terms that they themselves determine rather than some outside authority determining it. Yeah, and, and, and something that I see maybe, I wouldn't call it a problem, but a possible issue or what could create like losers in this system is people not um, capable of self-assessing well enough and end up um, losing things that they could potentially or like, you know, and, and maybe ideally take the best use of, but can't because they can't evaluate it properly. And, and that may that may go across a lot of the things that you you propose in the book is that the intelligence of people to participate in these markets is higher than what is that may, may be average. Yeah. So um, first of all, there's some real, relatively easy things that individuals could do. They could just overassess the value of their assets by a factor of two or three uh, or four, and then it's going to be very unlikely that things are going to be taken. Now they'll pay more taxes for this. But for most people who aren't extremely wealthy, that will still be very much in their interest because, um, uh, you know, given that most of the wealth is held by very wealthy people, if, as we propose in the idea, you redistribute the value that's raised by the tax to people in equal shares, uh, people will be able to use that to maintain their assets. Now, um, I think that in practice, we shouldn't think of individuals doing this themselves. We should think of there being a variety of different communities or organizations that people are part of that assist them in doing this and participate in helping them figure out all these values. And the goal there is really to say, look, we not everyone has to be on their own. You don't have to be alone and just figure out all the stuff yourself. But on the other hand, we're not just going to create a system that effectively puts all that authority in the hands of either a central government or in the hands of whoever happens to have the monopoly on that asset right now. We're going to diffuse that power throughout the economy and allow new uh, organizations to build up that can help individuals and that can uh, be voluntary bases for figuring those questions out. So I'm not relying on individuals all alone to figure things out. I'm just saying we shouldn't, because individuals might have some challenges, just assign all that power to some central authority who's thought to do it in a benevolent way. And one of the ways I could kind of see that happening is, so right now we have HOAs, like let's just say you're talking about housing market, you know, real estate. Um, you know, HOAs are kind of uh, in certain ways, but like a similar idea could come together where a neighborhood can do some sort of quadratic voting system where they could kind of assess the value of property on the neighborhood and set sort of a baseline. And then a, anything you do we above that back, is... Please take a step back and explain quadratic voting yeah, before we please, dig into it. Please do, yeah. Yeah, so quadratic voting is a system of making decisions as groups that's based on a similar type of auction-like principle where everyone is allocated the same number of voice credits that they're able to use 
but rather than you having one vote on every issue, you can have uh, many votes on one issue and fewer votes on another. But in particular, it's not like you can just put all your votes on one issue and um, get that proportionally more influence. Instead, it becomes increasingly expensive as you put more influence on one given issue to influence that one more. And if you put less on another, it becomes cheaper. And so that leads you to want to value things in proportion to how important they are to you rather than allocating everything to the one issue that you care most about. And you call it quadratic voting because one vote is equal to one vote token. Let's just say this in reference yeah. to tokens, voice token. Um, two votes is equal to four voice tokens. Three votes is equal to nine voice tokens and so far, so uh, and so forth. So it's literally the square of the number of uh, tokens that you 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 you, uh, you I'm sorry the square root of the number of tokens that you spend. So if you spend nine tokens, you get three votes. Um, and and I think that's really interesting because it really means that your extra emphasis has a cost to it, a marginal cost associated with it. So you can kind of you know you do this only if you're very serious about it. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. Have you seen any of these quadratic voting systems in play uh, in the real world? Oh, there's lots of them. Um, one of the most prominent ones is that XM chain, uh, which is a Ethereum-based um, block, uh, sort of import-export regulatory compliance and supply chain management platform is using quadratic voting to elect block makers. But um, it's being thought about quite seriously, actually at the protocol layer for Ethereum, um, it's being thought about, uh, it's being used in um, just a whole range of different uh, projects within the blockchain space. There are activist groups using it to form participatory government platforms. We've used it for polling. So it, there, there's a whole range of uh, potential applications. I see I see um, a potential issue here, maybe not an issue, um, but it, it, in order to civil attack this, maybe not civil attack, but like if you look at this in the in the in maybe confines of the Ethereum system, it would be trivial to say if you wanted twenty votes as opposed to doing twenty squared, you just make twenty accounts and do one vote each. And so, in order to have quadratic voting work, you need some type of like know your customer associated with it, and then a scarcity associated with how votes are or how voting tokens are then dispersed across that that known set of people who can vote. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Um, quadratic voting is very liable to civil attacks if you don't have some identity solution. So an identity solution is absolutely critical for this. And by the way, for many other uh, things you'd want to do under on Ethereum, one of my biggest problems with existing cryptocurrency ecosystems is that they formalize the notion of ownership, but they don't formalize the notion of individual human beings. And any system that formalizes money and doesn't formalize people will serve money and not serve people. And that's not what any of us want to see. Well, a lot of the reasoning behind that is it's a very difficult problem. Um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not, it's not easy without a central authority to verify an individual. Um, I don't think that's necessarily true. I've, I've had a lot of thoughts about ways that you could potentially do that. So um, I don't know if, how much you want to get into it, but um, I'm increasingly <laughs> working on things like this. And I think that there are ways through social networks effectively that you can do this. And then effectively, the centralized authority is really just one architecture for such a social network and not even the one that really goes on in the real world. Because, you know, even when um, I uh, verify, for example, someone I might potentially employ and properties about them, I don't really do that through the government. I mostly do that through a letter of recommendation or something like this, right? Um, so I actually think if we can formalize some of those IRL dynamics, um, we have the possibility to actually build an even more robust solution to the identity problem than currently exists in centralized architectures. So what you're proposing then is, a, and this is something, so in 2005, I threw up a website called onlinekarma.net. I was trying to basically attack just the kind of like an idea sort of an identity problem where, you know, you have all these karma systems across multiple sites and you want to kind of unify them under one umbrella. Um, the technology wasn't there to do that effectively. So I gave up on the idea, but um, to me, it seems like your personal rating is who you are. 
and you'd want to not diversify that across multiple profiles because that's bad. Um, is this kind of what you're say- saying here, or is it something? Uh, I'm saying something to- bigger and deeper than that. I think that actually you want to have a representation of the social network, maybe stored locally that people have, and use friends and friends of friends and and th- these sorts of trust relationships that exist in that social network to be a substrate over which a verification message of a property of an individual flows. And that once you have that infrastructure in place, then um, it's actually pretty easy to uh, do the disambiguation that's necessary to avoid civil attacks because you can ask for verification of various principles until you reach the point where the um, individuals are uniquely identified. Is that is that um, against the notion of privacy and, and anonymity? Can you can you have no, both of those things I, in there? Well, uh, so first of all, anonymity. I don't know exactly what anonymity means. I mean, if anonymity means I'm allowed to do anything without verifying any properties of who I am at all, yeah, it's against that. But I think that that is an anti-human notion because it says that the only thing that is relevant for you is some material possession that you have and not anything about who you are. And I think that that we, we, we don't want that. That's not a desirable world in almost any circumstance. On the other hand, does it require you to reveal everything about yourself? Absolutely not. Imagine that you're trying to um, distinguish whether I'm civil attacking you. Uh, you could ask for various various questions about me, like, what is my birth date? Or when was my first kiss? Or what is like, you know, you could disaggregate my fingerprint into a hundred or, you know, a hundred thousand bits or whatever. And you could ask what bit 175 or 2064 is. And you could have a set of questions that are like that. And you could ask those until, uh, you know, you get to a point where we're disambiguated. Um, But in that process, there are probably about a billion questions that define me uniquely as an individual. And you probably only need to go through a hundred of those by the combinatorics of it to with high probability uniquely distinguish every human being. And knowing a hundred randomly selected questions about you does not reveal you to the person who's verifying you. It only reveals a very, very, very tiny fraction of what you are to them. And it can be chosen in a way that is um, not useful to them in other contexts. So I think with appropriately designed such protocols, it's possible to both disambiguate individuals and avoid civil attacks while not revealing the whole picture of the individual to anyone else. That's very interesting. I have to think about that for a while. I wrote a boat. I wrote a blog post a long time ago to try to like create the analogy of a Merkelization of an individual as like all the experiences and and thoughts and biology of an individual kind of comes together to form a a final hash of who that individual is. And you know that kind of speaks to what you were just saying. Is like you know yeah, having I think Merkel that, proofs of that analogy. type of thing. Does it tell you about the entire tree? Just it can prove that the hash is the hash without having to show you the entire tree. Right. So let's just say you have an individual. Um, a collection of individuals working together towards a common goal is in a corporation, an organization of some type. Um, do you, uh, so you feel like identity is just kind of a foundational need we have in this decentralized space. Once we have that, um, what would identify a particular uh, corporation, some sort of charter or how does that, you know, uh, so just to give you an idea of where I'm, I'm getting this from, I really loved your parable of Oblomov and Hajar. I thought it was lovely. It was great. It was fantastic. Um, so anyone who kind of has owned a company knows that choosing your board members is essential for, you know, a, a successful business. If you don't choose wisely, that's bad. Um, and, and furthermore, like even that goes deep into like institutional investors, uh, they can acquire clout, clout by just owning a significant portion of your organization. Um, how do you see organizations being formed in the future, um, given this decentralized trustless system, assuming we have the identity uh, problem down? Yeah, so Vitalik um, 
Buterin, uh, Zoe Hitzig, and I have a paper called Liberal Radicalism, in which we give, I think, quite a radical new vision of what organizations might look like and how they might be structured in the future. Um, the idea it, it has a lot of similarities, both with market processes and some similarities with democracy and some similarities with charitable organizations. The notion is that individuals would make contributions towards these organizations or projects, sort of like crowdfunding, but that there would be matching funds that would support them and make up for the fact that the individuals have an incentive to free ride and just allow um, others to make the contributions. Uh, and that the taxes necessary to do, provide those subsidies would be you know, collected by something like the process that we were describing before with the property. And um, in that world, um, organizations uh, are really some sort of a collective formation, but not based on ownership, but rather based on collective action of some sort. Now, what do you mean by collective action exactly? I don't, I don't um, necessarily understand that. I know the idea of like uh, you know, DAOs and stuff, which direct funds to particular causes um, or businesses that the um, the DAO supports in proportion to however people are voting. I know that is is that kind of what you're talking about here, or do you mean actual like? Actions? Well, you can imagine an organization putting up any charter that it wants of how it's going to operate or the principles on which it operates. It could be a DAO, it could be a charity, it could be, it could be democratically governed or quadratically voting governed or in a hierarchical way governed or however you want. But the funding model for it, rather than being like contributions that people make or ownership stakes that people take, it would be basically they would make um, something like a standard charitable contribution, except that most of the funds would actually come from a matching that would be given by some uh, process that is external to the contributors themselves. Um, something like, uh, you know, the Ethereum grant making foundation, et cetera. And the matching would be done in an algorithmic way so that all the funds would be distributed in a decentralized way without any central grant making authority having to be in charge. Now, when you wrote the book, how much, how much were you aware of the, like the systems like Ethereum in place or did, was it, did that inform a good portion of how you thought about these books in the future or did that, or that the intricacies of how these things work kind of come later on when Vitalik kind of sensationalized your book and brought you to the public eye of, of uh, this the community? Yeah, so I wasn't thinking about blockchain stuff at all. I was vaguely aware that some people involved with something called Ethereum were interested in using quadratic voting for like social networking or whatever. But that was about the extent of my knowledge. Um, and then there was this guy called Vitalik Buterin who tweeted out one of my papers once we'd already basically written the book, but it hadn't been published yet. And when I first looked this guy up, I sort of thought he was a Bond villain or something. You know, he's like a 24-year-old kid, <laughs> uh, you know, with a billion dollars or whatever, living in Zug, Switzerland. Who knows where that is? Um, and so I just assumed that, um, you know, he was some sort of a scammer or something like that. And then um, I nonetheless, because when he tweeted my thing out, I got more traffic on that than I've gotten on uh, basically Twitter for the whole rest of the time I've been on Twitter. And so I said, do you want to look at my manuscript? I'd be interested in your comments. And he sent me uh, about 20 pages about it, um, just sort of talking about how he thought it was, you know, the future of liberalism and so forth, um, and asking lots of questions. And um, then that was the beginning of what's become probably my closest collaboration at this point is with him uh, working on many things together. So, so yeah. yeah, that's, yeah. Like that's how I really knew your book was kind of the real deal too. It was like when yeah. Vitalik said something, I was like, okay, this is, this is serious. So um, I took it very seriously, went out and got a copy. Um, 
So what kind of things are you and Vitalik working on? Um, well, the main thing that we worked on so far is this paper, Liberal Radicalism, that I uh, mentioned. But we're also working on a paper called Taking Vickery Seriously, Not Literally, which is like a methodology paper trying to talk about what is the methods lying underneath these types of things we've been working on together so other people can do them. You can almost think of it as a crypto economics type methodology paper. Um, but we're also working on some more practical initiatives where we, you know, we've been appearing together uh, in a variety of contexts, you know, from political to corporate to try to promote the idea of, you know, more decentralization of power within the dig digital economy and the broader world economy. Um, he's involved with this radical exchange event that we are planning. I think he's going to be a keynote speaker there. Um, so, uh, I view him as, you know, one of the three or four people who's like most important to all the things that we're doing around these ideas. So when you say taking Vickery seriously, um, so, so our audience is, is, uh, knows a Vickery auction is where, uh, everybody kind of bids and the person who wins, who bids the highest gets it, but they pay the price of the second highest bid. Um, maybe you could go into some of the economic details behind that and why it's so interesting. Well, so that's an example of Vickery's scheme, but it's really not the main point. So Vickery's general principle is that everybody reports, you know, takes actions. They report what they want to do, and they are forced to pay the consequences that that has for other people in the society into a pool. So in the case of the auction, um, everyone bids. And they pay the second highest bid, but that's just because what is the cost to society of you winning that thing? It's taking it away from the person who valued it the second most and would have won otherwise, right? And so um, that is the principle behind the Vickery auction. And the idea um, or the difficulty behind that is is quantifying the, the like, social cost of winning? Uh, well, so... In the case of uh, the second price auction, it's relatively clear, but in a more complicated case, like an election and so forth, then finding a way that isn't easily manipulable to quantify that cost of you winning requires careful mechanism design. And Vickery gave a general solution, but a very fragile one. And what I and Vitalik and many others have been working on is coming up with more robust solutions that give you an approximation to that social opportunity cost associated with uh, your winning. I see. And I was curious, like, as you've, like, since you've written the book and had this collaboration with Vitalik and have learned more about these, like, decentralization systems or blockchain systems and networks, has that swayed any of your opinions that you wrote during the book? Because I, I think it might in regards to your, uh, data laborer and, and how people own data within these blockchain networks versus how corporations own data within the centralized networks or the siren servers, as you call them in the book. Yeah, I mean, a lot of my views on many things have been evolving. Um, the importance of identity has become much more clear to me. The, um, the importance of collective organizations and uh, the role of public goods has become much more important to me. Issues about status and signaling have become much more central to my thinking. And within my concept of data as labor, the notion of, um, first of all, moving beyond just data as labor, but thinking more broadly about the centralization of power over our attention and over uh, news quality and all this sort of stuff on the one hand, but also thinking about the role of building up organizations that are not the platforms, not this overwhelming behemoth, but that are large enough to help protect people um, has becoming increasingly important to me and clear. So <clears throat> you're talking about protecting people kind of triggered something else in me that, that reminds me of the book. You, you spoke a lot about how democracy is organized. Um, for, like immigration, I think was a big point you brought up brought up in there, uh, where you propose an alternate uh, scenario to say H one B visas. Um, 
do you feel like governments will be benefiting from these tra- uh, decentralized systems and what will they look like? Um, well, I, I think that uh, I don't even like the idea or term government necessarily. I, I, I increasingly have come to have the view that um, th- this sort of anarchist notion that we shouldn't have a government is not just a, um, is not so much a ideal as a reality. The truth is that um, different types of organizations have different power over different things. And what we should try to avoid is any particular source of power becoming too overwhelming or too entrenched. And uh, all sorts of collective organizations can potentially benefit from these ideas. But on the other hand, all will have to, as you know, was is true with the economic value justified by the cost, produce value commensurate to their position of power and not be able to just in an arbitrary way, just because they've always been there, continued to exist. So um, in, in the world that I imagine, uh, there will be all sorts of governments. In some level, the family is a government over its members. At some level, uh, international organizations are governments over some aspects of life and states and uh, national governments and international organizations. So the, the vision I increasingly believe in is what I would call polypolitan. So I'm not cosmopolitan. I don't believe in a world government, but I also don't believe in the absoluteness of national governments. I believe in complex overlapping collective organizations that help protect us make us individuals precisely because of all the different things we're engaged in and protect us from the overwhelming power of any uh, persistent, centralized, or um, protected, historically derived hierarchical authority. It seems as though um, that, that aligns quite well with how you, how you porch, like, reason about how the systems we have now came to being and that like, Adam Smith and the, and the Constitution were a, were a radical idea at that time. But over time in the development of technology in our society, those don't work anymore. And, and so we need a new radicalization of markets to then change the way we exist today. And that's kind of the future you're seeing now in terms of what you just painted. Is that, is that a correct thing to say? Yeah, I think that's right. And I think it also fits into the vision of identity that we were talking about before, this notion that it's through the social network, through a Merkelization of the individual or all those things are there the contributions of different communities to them? That's what makes them an individual. That's my view of decentralization. What decentralization is really about is not about isolated individuals. It's about the diversity of communities and how differentiated individuals can be precisely because of the way in which they're the intersection of all these different things. And the market you create to have them interact that like that, that defines the social interactions and relationships they have with respect to each other and value exchange kind of has an emergent property of what the government of those markets is. Is that, I, I think that's kind of what you're trying to say here. Yeah. Okay. And then I, I wholeheartedly agree, but I, I don't see a clear path on how to get there. And I, and I think yeah, you see that first that's... of like, we can't just do this. We need to do it in small places where it makes sense to try and experiment with these things. And as we then iterate the, the, the like this effectiveness of them, they can grow and grow and grow. I see Ethereum and networks like Ethereum being ripe and ideal for this because of the way you can um, deterministically code in the relationships of various, I guess, markets, if you will. And it's just a great playing ground for trying to do these types of things. Yeah, absolutely. And, but, you know, it's not enough. It's, we can't just have entrepreneurship. We can't just have the ideas. We also need things that help those markets be designed in terms of the way they feel to people in a way that's resonant with their experience. And we need science fiction to help people imagine these worlds. And we need, um, uh, you know, other forms of art. We need virtual reality experiences. We need activists who can help organize these things into a movement. We, and we need all those to be intersecting with each other. And so that's the reason why we've set up this movement in a way that tries to connect all those different pieces to each other, because it's only together that they're going to succeed. So, Science fiction touches a great point with me. I mean, I, I, I'm a huge fan of taking science fiction and using it as a model for building the future. Uh, but something that people consider science fiction in 
the economics field is economic equilibrium. Do you feel like these markets will help us obtain that? Or is that even a realistic goal to strive for? Yeah, I mean, I think the fundamental flaw of modern economic theory is that the vision of some competitive general equilibrium economy was viewed as a description of the reality rather than as a optimistic piece of science fiction. And um, that's much more the spirit of my book. I view that as a North Star that towards which we're aiming, not a point that we've achieved. Is it a mathematical ideal? Or is it just something we can achieve? Is it something that we'll always strive to get to, but never get there? Or is it, do you feel like we can actually- Well, I think our view of even what it is, is going to continue to evolve and, and, and change. But, um, but no, I don't, I, I don't think, I don't think, I, I'm not a utopian. I don't think that there is a final thing. I think uh, as technology evolves, it, it'll change our, our moral compass. And as our moral compass changes, what we aim at will change. And that's the, and, 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 and I don't think even at any given moment that there is a final or ultimate good. I think that ultimate good is derived from the diversity of the people who hold those values and it co-evolves with it. So um, I don't want to see uh, us just implement yeah. some final notion of a utopia. That, that makes sense. And I, I see like you know, the path is the right way to go, but you have to strive towards something. Is there some fundamental characteristic of these systems that you think is like most sacrosanct, something that we are striving towards, regardless of the technology we use to get there? Well, I think my... The basic principle that I lay down in this book is the notion of um, breaking up concentrated, historically derived um, hierarchical authority and allowing for a fluid uh, flow of um, heterogeneous, diverse, and growing ever larger and more complicated uh, human organization. There's a wonderful quote from Oliver Wendell Holmes that I think summarizes something of my philosophy um, and is the epigraph for Jane Jacobs' wonderful book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. Um, let me see if I can find it and read it to you. Um, so he writes... Um, until lately, the best thing that I could think in favor of civilization, apart from the blind acceptance of the order of the universe, was that it made possible the artist, poet, the philosopher, and the man of science. But I think that it is not the greatest thing. Now I believe that the greatest thing is a matter that comes directly home to all of us. When it is said that we are too much occupied with the means of living to live, I answer that the chief worth of civilization is just that it makes the means of living more complex that it calls for great and combined intellectual effort instead of simple and uncoordinated ones in order that the crowd may be fed and clothed and houses moved from place to place. Um, because more complex and intense intellectual efforts mean a richer and fuller life, they mean more life. Life is an end in itself. And the only question as to whether it is worth living is whether you have enough of it. Yeah. And that, that really rings home for anybody who works in the U.S. right now where our work weeks are insane and our expectations are pretty high and our vacations very well. Yeah. <laughs> like we're not living very well, you know, uh, but, you know, we make that money. Um, it, so something that's – so, I, I, like I said, I've been crossing my my field of expertise a little bit, following the model of Vitalik and branching out from hard computer scientists to understanding economics. And some things that have, you know – I read Zero to One by Peter Thiel, and he he hails the virtue of monopoly. Um, and I feel as though when he speaks of it, we're not actually they're, they're talking about a free market that doesn't exist. It's kind of like a fantasy marketplace that they make up when they talk about these kind of things. Um, do you say it's a fair statement that you're trying to avoid monopoly? Because I kind of almost feel like the more even with, you know, any competitive market will have gravitating power in one direction. And isn't that just some kind of monopoly? And isn't, isn't that have negative consequences that affect the many uh, in, you know, in benefit of the few? Yeah. I mean, I think that perhaps the fundamental principle of the book is anti-monopoly. Um, and 
that doesn't mean that you don't need some temporary uh, power to be given to some people in reward and to protect the things that they've created. That's true. But um, so I think the myth that everything one does everything just for free and so forth is probably wrong. But I think that monopoly is an incredibly inefficient and just stupid way to organize collective activity. Um, it's much better, you know, it, it, it's wasteful, it excludes people. Um, it requires all sorts of expenditures to maintain that exclusion. It's just a sort of very stupid way and wasteful way to organize um, activity. So what we need to do is get beyond that and um, find better ways to organize people collectively. And that's the fundamental principle of the book. And I think an opposite of that is people like, I don't know if anyone listening is familiar with the neo-reaction movement, um, but they are really about sort of doubling down on that monopolistic control. And uh, that's precisely what we want to avoid. We want to avoid the monarchies and the concentrated authority. So I think that brings up a, a quote that I hear very often is that, uh, you know, government is a monopoly over violence or coercion yeah. or however you want to put that. But you're very, you're, you, you don't support the modern or the current notion of government in that in the future you feel as though that'll be an antiquated kind of way of looking at things. But how do we regulate a society when we don't have a monopoly even over the asset of violence? Well, look, the truth is that uh, the notion that the government has a monopoly over violence is a little bit misleading. If someone steps onto your property, you have a right to shoot them. So it's not literally the government that has the monopoly over violence. Uh, it All private property is a monopoly over violence within a limited sphere, right? Um, there's really no difference between monopoly and a monopoly over violence. They're the same thing. Uh, all property is violence because it's the violence to stop someone else from using that property. So I think in the future, um, different organizations will control different scarce assets and they will have the right to use violence to maintain that control, but that control will be checked by the fact that they have to pay a self-assessed tax and stand ready to surrender that assets control to someone else if they're willing to pay them for it. So I think there won't be a monopoly of violence. There won't be a monopoly, period. All these things will be diffused across a variety of different organizations. And in fact, we don't have a monopoly of violence right now um, because there are many different governments in the world. So that's not a monopoly. It's a local monopoly over violence. But again, even within the government's territory, there are states. And within states, there are property owners. And so the notion that the government has a monopoly over violence, is, it's, a, it's a myth, but it's, it's not a reality. Yeah. Yeah. And I think when they say that, they mean collective violence, meaning that it's one, it's different if you create a lynch mob, it's then when the government throws in the, you know, sends in the National Guard. Um, and, and right. And, but the thing is, like, uh, there are things that the government can do, and there's other things the government can do, can't do um, constitutionally. Right. Uh, so, and, and in fact, like, to the extent that a corporation has a legal right to control certain assets, actually the corporation has a monopoly over violence because it can stop the government from doing something. So I, I just I just think that the whole language is misleading and, and actually fundamentally confused. Yeah, I, I, I want to I want to say like every system you create of sticks and carrots ends up leading to an emergent like phenomenon of, of social behavior, and over time as that same system of six and carrots exists, people learn to optimize around it. And you kind of allude to this inside the book of people continuously, like regulatory re regulation on corporation continuously tries to run and run as fast as possible to stay in one place. And the idea of this book is to design, like using the knowledge that we have and experience we have from the systems we have and creating new systems of better sticks and carrots to then make more um, sociable, systems later on down the line but we right. just don't know what's going to end up happening because those systems don't exist and you can't predict emergent phenomenons you can try but more often than not you're wrong well and in, and and what you really want to do is 
for that reason, try to keep things at a high level of abstraction and setting the fundamental rules. You don't want to be too prescriptive. You don't want to say the future should or is going to look like this. You want to keep the basic principle of diversity and decentralization in mind and then leave as much as possible to that process to actually reveal itself and emerge. What if the emergent property is kind of atrocious? Um, and that's a kind of like, okay, who's going to take care of like the mentally challenged? Um, we would have to rely on the generosity of the public to do that. And that's kind of a difficult thing for me to believe in right now. Um, well, I mean, in this system, uh, the notion is precisely that you would be, um, you know, all the funds would be recycled in an equal form, maybe through collective organizations or maybe through, uh, you know, an individual universal basic income or something like that to individuals. So. Um, by the very rules of the system, there would be a reasonably egalitarian sharing of the value of our collective wealth. And that's going to be a difficult sell in the United States because well, even I don't UBI think so. I think it's kind think, of a rebranding of communism, really. Well, um, yeah, and of free markets at the same time. I mean, it's, um, I, think, socialism, then. I think that the division between communism and free markets has been extremely artificial and it was a result of the cold war and Stalinist dictatorship and all this sort of stuff. But if you actually follow the logic of the free market through to its natural conclusions, it ends at a place that's very similar to what happens if you follow socialism through to its logical conclusions. Yeah. And that's something that I, I was very shocked when I read Friedman um, is that he, he really emphasized on the necessary balance between centralization and decentralization. He didn't discard centralization. He saw the benefits of something like FEMA. Um, but um, he, he, you know, he was kind of like balancing those two. Now, I know you might not be specifically a Friedman economist. I'm not quite sure where you stand on that. But um, to me, I always see there's an, an immediacy to central centralization. And then there's a, uh, a more of a, a experimentation and a evolution through decentralization. And it feels like there's more of a balancing act than anything else, then we still will need some sort of centralization. Well, I think what we need is diverse collective organizations rather than an extreme focus on either um, the individual or the collective whole. I think we need that balance, not just say there's some roles for the whole and there's some roles for the individual. No, what we need is true diversity in the forms of organization where we get to the maximum amount of heterogeneity and accommodation of individual difference precisely through having a variety of different collective organizations that are protected against free writing. With each organization having a specific cause or purpose or desire. And roles and assets that are not absolutely owned by that organization, but contestable through the process of common ownership. And I think that's the real interesting part here is the psychological, uh, I can't remember which chapter you mentioned, but there was a psychological attachment to property. And by removing the concept of property as we currently know it, to more of a renter kind of system, which is what I feel like it, 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 it's, it feels more like, um, people kind of detach from the way that they treat um, the, the things that they have, the things that they own, their assets. Um, uh, you know, I, I think it sounds great, but we are addicted to the concept of property. And so to go back to Corey's question, I, I'm struggling to find a solid path that will get us there short of a catastrophe and complete reorganization. And even in that case, I feel like- Well, I think people are already getting there. I think the way that it's happening at the present moment is through- um, the sharing economy, it's through all the ways that technology is changing our lives. It's through um, the, uh, you know, the blockchain that is giving people different notions. Of, I, I think this is starting to happen. And private property is actually not such an old idea. It's a relatively new one. It starts, you know, with agriculture and so forth. And it's still very unusual and surprising in many Eastern societies. So I think the truth is, that uh, our attitudes on these things have evolved and will continue to evolve for the better. Assuming we have good 
ways of getting there. I mean, I think Ethereum is an outstanding example of this type of thing of experimentation um, in these types of systems. But it's not the only one. You know, the Federal Communications Commission can experiment with the spectrum, and they're seriously thinking about doing that. Um, The British government is thinking about doing it for um, oil drilling and uh, landing slots at Heathrow and so forth. So I, I think there's many pathways for experimentation. All right. Um, I think that's a great kind of start to wrap up. Is there any questions that you wish we would have asked you that we didn't get around to asking you? No, I thought this was a great conversation. It covered many different things, both the deeper philosophy and newer things and, and the, some of the topics in the book. So. Yeah, it was really great to have you on, man. I, I love the book again, cannot recommend it enough. Everybody go out and buy radical markets. It's amazing. Even if you Um, disagree with a lot of what we said, he he lays a very cogent argument for each of the things we talked about and with a lot of uh, detailed, like, data to back a lot of it up. They're very evidence-based, and I was very happy about that. So if if you don't like any of the things that we talked about, please go out and read the book so you have at least um, a way to understand, to fully understand his argument before you have, like, maybe possible dissent. Yeah, and I, I got to say, you know, the cool part about it is it's finally testable in my mind. I don't think we could have tested your ideas properly prior to having something like Ethereum out there. And we could begin, I, I feel like it's gonna, it would have been more difficult. I think we could, but it would have been way more difficult. Um, and I think it's, it's great that we have this sort of foundational architecture developing, which can allow us to start um, playing around with some of these concepts. So it's a really exciting time, and it's a really great book. It came out at the right time. And um, yeah, thank you for writing it. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Yeah, Dr. Wild, before you leave, how can people get a hold of you or contact you or is there anything you'd like to plug? Yeah, the thing I think uh, people should know about is we have this new movement called Radical Lowercase X Capital Change. And um, it has four tracks, ideas and research, arts and communications, entrepreneurship and technology, and activism in government. I hope people involved in any of those areas or even curious about being involved in any of those areas will try to plug into the movement, consider attending the conference or contributing something to it, or even uh, we have some opportunities still left to volunteer for the conference. So um, I'm, I'm really looking forward uh, to that uh, exchange. Thanks. How's that? Thanks a lot. T- take care. Bye. Thank you.